We're about to have a panel. I'm going to go over. I will ask a question to begin with and then throw it open to the floor. There's a couple of questions I want to sort of cheat and turn into one question. Um, Chris mentioned Advance Australia and that was on my list of we need to talk about um, how well organised and how um, the media communications <laughs> of these um, religious groups have become so professional and powerful and why we seem to keep stumbling and falling when it comes to doing effective campaigns. But before I get to that, I want to ask, we haven't talked a lot about women and yet it strikes me that the rise of this very macho, it is very male dominated, uh, paleo-libertarian uh, movement Jordan Peterson being involved is a clear example of that, is we were always warned when women um, not only got rights but started to tell the truth about their lives, their real lives, that the whole world would split open. Is that is what is happening? And are we witnessing um, the last gasp or possibly the new beginning of the patriarchy reasserting its control? Fan, you want to begin on that one? Yeah, no problem. Easy. Um, yeah. <laughs> I knew you'd have it. Yeah, well, look, obviously that's happening. Uh, those of you who haven't read my book, QAnon, and on a short and shocking history of internet conspiracy cults, really should read it because it's about how Steve Bannon, who is the greatest political genius of our era and unfortunately quite possibly Satan, he <laughs> recognised... Um, he had a really formative experience. Like, he is, he is one of the brains behind these international networks and linking up all of these paleo-libertarians with, with allies and building coalitions in order to realise their agenda, which in his case is turning America into a white ethno-state. Um, Bannon saw in the 1990s what he described as the monster power of young men who were good with computers, who felt that they had been left behind, that feminism and sexual liberation had, had meant that they would lose purchase on getting laid, essentially, um, and that they would be judged as inferior uh, by the new generation of women who felt, you know, confident to make demands about their own lives and parity in relationships and autonomy and all of those things that one would consider to be just human rights. And Bannon weaponised that community. He was very involved in the internet communities around websites like 4chan and he essentially channeled misogyny through people like Milo Yiannopoulos, who was the internet provocateur, um, into a political movement. I mean, they all backed Trump. They were agents of Trump online. They were campaigning for Trump. They certainly support that. Uh, the grab them by the pussy edict it was actually a motto to them for political um, mobilisation that, you know, this idea of a masculinity that took that fought feminists and described in one of their slogans, Milo Yiannopoulos' most famous slogan was feminism is cancer. Oh, I see and that. people like myself and feminists across the world found ourselves targeted by these campaigns to humiliate and publicly denigrate and marginalise us. When I went on, I was on Q&A in 2016 and had at the time a quite infamous battle with Steve Price, who's just a reprehensible nitwit. Um, where he told me that I was being hysterical when I was talking about domestic violence and I got him one and I said, oh, it's my ovaries making me do it and made him look like the nitwit that he is, which he didn't like. And um, I was subjected to... I think I got a 1,000 death threats in an hour. Um, I had every social media channel choked with just constant abuse, threats on my life. Um, it was incredible. Like, I had to leave the country. The harassment was so bad. And I found out years, uh, years later that it had actually been organised through 4chan and a lot of the people who were attacking me never heard of me, never heard of Q&A, never heard of Steve Price. But because I had, you know, had this moment in the Australian media expressing a feminist point of view to some, you know, public acclamation at the time that I had been identified as a target. Like they hacked my Twitter account and put out abusive misogynistic porn with my name on it. And things like that. And of course, I mean, I got off comparatively lightly compared to what they did to feminists like Anita Sarkeesian, who has to have a 24-hour police 
um, protection to people like Brianna Wu, who had to move house four times because they were calling in SWAT teams to attack her and, you know, this incredible campaign. And a lot of it is the way that, um, that feminism is presented to this, you know, vulnerable community who are centrally organised because they are. Like, in politics, you go to where the people are and you build power by an accumulation of small slices. And it's extraordinary to consider the kind of, like, losers who hang out on 4chan in an alliance with these Christian communities. But you're looking at groups of people who are mobilised by the right symbols, the right dogmas and emotionally potent oversimplifications. And I am quoting Noam Chomsky on that one. And that's how they get them. And they unite them in this movement by creating common enemies, by identifying an evil which is represented by very simple tropes that have backing in the literature and narratives that they've inherited. And they understand it, the targets are easy and they follow them. And it's one of the reasons why I do say to atheists, if you're interested in fighting this battle, and my recommendation to read the Bible is not for your spiritual health, it's for your um, discursive armament. Because one of the things we know about uh, conversion and deconversion is that specifically breaking Christians off the Christian right is much easier if you could speak to them in the language of values that they understand. And you have people who are like refugees from the Westboro Baptist Church who came out of that horrific homophobic misogynistic right-wing cult by other Christians speaking to them about the words of Jesus in the Bible and how their practice was antithetical to the values that they supposedly represented. And it's finding that common language of belief and speaking in a language which is accessible and familiar, which is incredibly important in the war that we're fighting. Mm. And I think where progressives get into enormous amounts of trouble is to... Um, I mean, there's a tendency in some progressive movements to sort of appoint themselves a moral elite, which is antithetical to democracy and not... And, you know, these kind of purity and identity politics that divide more than they unite is unbelievably dangerous. And you could see that in elements of the Democratic Party in the United States in the competition against Trump, where having purity left of the now competitions was alienating vast swathes of people. There's an individualist tendency that, you know, like there is a person in Australia who shall remain nameless who identifies as a progressive who won't join a union because they consider them patriarchal institutions. And I'm like, I'm sorry, they're the organised mobilisation of the working class. By the way, the three largest trade unions are dominated by women, one of, one of which, whose building we're sitting in right now. And in terms of mobilisation in the interests of democracy, equality and freedom, these are the weapons we've got and we are absolutely sacrificing ourselves if we don't use them. And it's getting to that common understanding, that shared language, that willingness to speak across the divide, the willingness to actually sacrifice purity of principle for collectivity of purpose, that is how we get out of this mess. Mm. Thank you. Very... Uh, <laughs> but, Leslie, doesn't it also speak to the fact that feminism has been phenomenally successful that they would need to organise to such an extraordinary extent um, to put it back in its box because... I mean, my view about patriarchal religion and the clue is in the name is that it is often... I've often said, you know, it's easy to see, pardon me, Van, I know you and I disagree on this, that all religions are man-made purely and simply because of their treatment of women. Like, they all, every last bloody one of them, including Buddhism, puts women second. So, you know, hello. And feminism is the only force on earth that has ever worked to say, that's bullshit. I think the essential contradiction we're having to deal with is on the one hand we keep getting told, and it is definitely true, that we are becoming a more progressive society. That basically the image is, a, is a, of a rat and a python. That the younger millennials and on down are far more progressive and women are even more progressive than men in that group. So much of the progressivism is actually coming from women. And so on the one hand... We saw it in the teals. They yeah. were all women and most of their supporters were women. Yeah. We're seeing it across the world. So again, mm. this is not just a phenomenon in Australia. We're actually seeing a huge democratic shift, uh, demographic shift that's happening because what shapes you as a young person and in your 20s is foundationally about the environment you live in. And so the range of reasons why all, you know, in advanced democracies, we're seeing this rat in a python. So older people are dying, younger people are more progressive. 
But I think one thing that's very confusing about that is you think, well, okay, if you have a democracy, then obviously what's just gonna happen is we're gonna all become more progressive and our politicians who are meant to represent us in a democracy will become more progressive and it all goes very nicely like that. But obviously that isn't what hap what's happening, so the question is why? And the answer is that you're seeing, I think, the panic of the various entrenched interests. So somewhere in the 30 to 40 years ago space, it was either the Federal Society or one of the other toxic ones in the United States, actually had written a report saying, this demographic is coming. We are being overwhelmed by progressivism in the, in the culture in general, and we have to start worrying about that. So in a dem democracy, the Republicans went, okay, it's a democracy, right? If our base is gonna shrink and we're no longer gonna have the ability to win elections fairly, we're gonna have to change who we are. And the Republicans actually began that process of, of starting to include black people, starting to change their messaging, starting to accept what a democracy demands you accept when your constituency is changing, which is that you adapt because your, Fiona's going, mm-hmm, so you're, <laughs> because you represent them. But a whole bunch of other people in the party got very, very panicked about losing entrenched privilege to women, to gay people, to, it's so like all people, the powers that be. Yeah. In other words, I don't think it's just restricted to, to the gender issue. It's across all the power axes. And they resisted. And you saw what happened in the United States, that religious, right-wing, conservative, rural group rose up and said, the Republican Party is ours. We are not changing. We are doubling down. And if we have to cheat to win, then we'll cheat. And that's when the voter suppression started. That's when the gerrymandering started. There are many ways to skin a cat if you're trying to take power. Playing fair in a democracy is only one. It's new, it's rare, it's fragile. So I think that's Just, really I'll, what I'll, we're seeing. I'll, I'm going yeah. to stop us now for a minute. Absolutely. And I'll come back to Van and get Chris. No, I'll, if I can ask you just to hold on that. I'll get Chris to answer the first question from the floor first, and then we'll work back through. Yes, because I'm sure there are lots of questions. So here comes the mic. Uh, the lady there with the stripy top, I think she had her um, yep, hand up. Quickest. Hello to all three of you, or to all four of you. I'm not sure if my question may yet be redundant because I wrote the question down when Van was speaking and by the time we got to Chris, uh, some of the answers that um, to my question may have been made. But the question is, um, do you think or that we in a dem democratic society can we develop strong feelings of community, family, charity, teaching our children to do the right thing, etc., you know, to be fair and, you know, without the need to have that instilled by um, a religious uh, background or education? Well, certainly we can. And, and to a large extent, it's the religious component and not all religions. And let me put a shout out here to progressive um, Christians and many of them that I work with who are doing everything they can to counter this very small but vocal part of Christianity that is causing fear, uncertainty and doubt in the community. Um, so look, there's a couple of things here. There is an actual strategy to cause chaos, fear, paranoia in the community and that is being done from the paleo-libertarian billionaires filtering down through the Christian nationalists and also associated groups. Um, but there's another thing that I want to talk about and that is that it's all very well for us to talk about being progressive and being progressive is important but being progressive is not important if you're a working class mum who hasn't got enough money to feed a family, if you're a disabled person who can't get on the disability pension, you know, and, and once the government and its policies stop helping people and people are struggling, then it's really easy for people to come in and spread fear, uncertainty and doubt and paranoia and begin to split the community. And then that leads to an autocratic leader coming in with a bit of charisma and saying, I can solve all your problems. Come to daddy. Come Man, to daddy. Do you wanna... Yeah, because this was one of the interesting things that came up in my research 
was about how there was a very popular image of the Trump voter as some kind of, you know, a poorly educated, he said they had that line, I love the poorly educated, poorly educated blue collar rube. And there was a lot of discussion around, you know, the white working class and how the white working class were inherently racist and that's why they were attracted to Trumpism. I'm sorry, but this is mythology. It is classist mythology, typically blaming working class people for everyone's problems. The single largest demographic determinant of whether you are a Trump voter or not is whether you are a member of a homeowners association. What we know about the far right is overwhelmingly they are a middle and ruling class phenomenon. Where the far right get power is through mobilising middle class, bourgeois, professional votes, shopkeeper votes, behind fascist parties because it, it doesn't mean that it's separate from the issue of um, disadvantage and it doesn't mean it's separate from the issue of economic dislocation. The cost of living crisis is a problem because it terrifies middle class people that they may fall from their status and end up with the grubby rest of us. And typically this is what happened in Nazi Germany, this is generally what happens when money gets behind far right causes, that's where it comes from. In Russia they call it babushka fascism. You know, the idea of, of old women and grandmothers who are the organising base of the Putinist project because they are maintaining their social, their social position and their social advantage by coming out for him. If you look at groups like the absolutely deplorable Moms for Liberty in the United States, they are a middle class movement of moneyed people with the time and resources. <laughs> This was one of the really interesting things about January 6th. And we know this because in the arrest records, you see lawyers, you see people who rented planes to come down to Washington to stay at the Hilton to overthrow the government on their weekend. Working class people in America cannot afford to take the weekend off to overthrow the government. Just and to be clear, I wasn't blaming the working class. Oh, no, class. no, I'm not, I'm, not <laughs> saying, I'm not saying this about you, like, you at all. But there are commentators who are perpetuating this fantasy and infamously in the New York Times talking about these stupid working class people. Actually, an organised working class and the trade union movement is the most robust defence we've ever had against the rise of fascism, which is why Nazis went after it first. That's right. OK, and now we're going to go to... There were some other hands up. Who else is looking for... There's a lady in the front here. I've got her hand up. My question is mainly to Leslie. Um, Good, because I was going to ask her to answer it first. So <laughs> um, the, the, the threat, to um, threat to democracy, I wonder how much you think AI is playing a part, and I say this, this is my, my thinking, is that there's very little critical thinking encouraged in universities, and universities don't know what to do with AI and students turning in PhDs when they're in first year type story. So that, that didn't come up at all and I was wondering where you stood on that. It came up on the slide I had to whip past. Um, so, so you're reading my mind, absolutely. So, I'm so, so I'm, glad I am because you, I thoroughly enjoyed it. <laughs> oh, good. Um, yeah, so I think it's very, I think uh, one of the, so basically it was coming up on a list of things that I think we can do. So one thing is what Jane picked up straight away because she's sharp as a tack, which is this idea of how we need to be clear about why we're opposed to particular religious people, but to think about it as a problem of authoritarianism and authoritarianism leading religious attraction, but authoritarians being elsewhere and them being the problem for secular society. But then the second thing is I think there's certain alliances we need to form with um, other groups where we might have common interest. AI is a huge, huge problem, I, I could, and I have gone for hours talking about it, so I'll just confine myself to the one bit that is particularly concerning about democracy, and it is live now. So there's a lot of thought about AI, you know, we tend to kind of default to the risk of. It's not the risk of as in it's in the future, it's now. Um, and it will be even worse by the time we have an election. It's a huge problem that there is an amplification. So already what social media was doing was amplifying the different kinds of um, dissenting voices in society and feeding up through heuristics in your feed kind of the most provocative, the most um, polarizing kinds of things. So social media isn't entirely responsible for polarization, but it's definitely in the mix. AI then puts that on steroids and it allows it to be personal. So that's exactly where they're gonna get to. They're gonna get to a place, and 
this is not very far away because you already have things like ChatGPT, where you can have a personal interaction with an AI which will understand who you are and try to convince you and manipulate your political views and what you do out in the world based on what it already knows about you and what you're happy to tell it. Um, and it also is going to, again, just ramp up the amount of disinformation and misinformation going on in the space. Having said that, and Jane Caro taught me this, the main thing that motivates people's behavior is not what they think, it's what they feel. So I was very shocked to hear that because of course I'm a philosophy academic, um, but Jane told me that many, many years ago, I still remember exactly where you told me it, we were in a cab and I was quite taken aback by it, but she's absolutely right, it's how we feel. And so AI is one of the things that is also going to be able to tap into how we feel and be able to manipulate that. And already we're seeing companions with replica and all of that stuff. So it is terrifying. And if we were to ally with other groups that were interested in trying to um, manage AI for the sake of democracy, I think there's a broad coalition to be found there. And the one other thing I think we should be doing is working on media issues. So we haven't been able to regulate social media. We need to regulate social media and AI. And again, a broad coalition that could do it in the service of uh, taking the temperature down, unpolarizing, um, a, a royal commission into the Murdochs would be nice. Yeah. Also, emotional literacy in the population. So few people understand their emotions, can articulate them, can analyze them, can control them, can question them, because we are taught to ignore them. And it, that's fatal and plays into the hands for people who will manipulate them. I'm going to get Chris to comment on that, and then I'm really sorry, we are so over time. We are meant to be having lunch. We are going to skip afternoon tea, but we might just take one more quick question and then bring it to a close. So, Chris. Yeah, just quickly want to add on AI. I was the researcher for Tracy Spicer's recent best-selling book on AI man-made. And when we looked at this, we looked at the people who own these big AI companies and they're all men, pretty much, um, and the people who develop the AI are all pretty wide, much they, all men. <laughs> but what we looked at was the economics of this. And we are seeing so much wealth flowing to individuals, some of whom have wealth, the equivalent of the GDP of some countries. These are paleo-libertarians. These are people who do not want the redistribution of wealth, people who do not want to pay tax, people who do not want any regulations put on them. And so, you know, when we're talking about AI, we are talking about exactly what Leslie and I were talking about, this concentration of wealth in a few people who are then using that wealth to undermine democracy and using people like Christian nationalists as voting blocks to be able to get into governments and white ant them. So, you know, we're seeing with AI the exploitation of the working class, they're paying, uh, you know, a lot of what they say is AI is actually people doing piecework at home, people actually doing manual work. It's not AI at all. Um, they're also exploiting people in the third world, in developing countries. So, you know, you have to look at the economics of this. I know that we're a secularist group. I know that we want to concentrate on church and state. I know that we want to go at the, the Christian right. But you have, we absolutely have to start looking at the layer above them in this pyramid scheme, the people who are accumulating untold wealth and concentrating it and then using it to undo democracy. Because if we don't have democracy, we're not going to have a separation of church and state. One last quick question. Uh, Pan at the back. Gentleman at the back. It's got to be a quick question. It's got to be quick, quick, quick answers. Sorry, everybody. Um, I asked this very quick question um, because I suspect I'm not the only teacher in the room, um, but I'm finding myself kind of bombarded um, at the moment with this kind of rise of conservative polarisation in my students. And I firmly believe that this battle is won and lost in the classroom, mm -hmm. particularly with our young people, um, high school teacher. I'm wondering, or I'm asking the panel, how do I fight this? daily in my classroom with my kids. Can I try and answer it? Yes. Um, I'd love to try and answer it because um, the, 
my organization, um, and I am here as an individual, but I do work at the Kramana Center for Ethical Leadership, and we've been doing a lot of work around polarization and thinking about the processes by which you can depolarize, that the, sh the short of it is that you need to reconnect people. So you need to reconnect people ultimately so they can get to a place where they are able to understand the difference between disagreeing profoundly with another person's point of view but still being able to respect that person. And there's a process by which you can kind of reconnect. Um, kids certainly would be extremely easy to do. You know, there's a vulnerability, there's a kind of, you know, a range of exercises that bring them back into connection with one another just as humans. And then by the time, you know, you lower the stakes to raise the stakes. By the time you bring them to actually talking about the issues they need to talk about, they're listening to understand rather than listening to speak. Um, and all of the different kinds of, they're able to sit with discomfort, they acquire some emotional um, intelligence. So you're actually bringing them a range of skills that are useful in a, in a range of places. But as you would know, it's a bit of a process, but you could run it with kids. I reckon you could run it through a day, and by the end of the day, you'd have a great improvement. Get them to act out that ad in the classroom. Why not? Well, that, in fact, is a really good shorthand for the kind of process that we do, that ad. Um, the thing, too, is that research shows that people's political opinions, like their religious opinions and everything else, are formulated by the seven people they spend the most time with. Yeah. And the reason why the For Every Child public education campaign is the most important political campaign in Australia at the moment is because we are trying to centre teachers who can facilitate numerous points of view and the facilities needed for critical thinking in a complex and very threatened democracy so they have the resources to be able to teach and not be stretched beyond their capacity to enable that experience for all students. And I'm quite sure all teachers in this room are committed to that campaign, but all of us have to understand that the public education campaign is not only supporting that necessary depolarisation de in the classroom and the creation of faculties for critical thinking, media literacy, <laughs> emotional literacy and everything else for political, spiritual, community diversity and carrying that, but also addressing that cost of living issue which is driving such a division between the haves and have nots in this country. It is one of the most proactive, practical things that we can do and the mass mobilisation required in order to deliver it is actually going to deliver the kind of democratic majority this country needs to affirm its secular values. Chris, last word to you. Last word to you. If you want it, you can always say no. Okay. In that case, thank our wonderful panel so much to unpack and.